People are doing it here. It's not just deprivation that does it, it's also having material wealth that does it. I mean, who's becoming evangelical and certain today? It's people who have wealth but find no meaning and become so desperate about the no meaning and see their lives falling apart and their children falling apart and the society crumbling around them in terms of the values that they came to believe in, they latch on to certainty. And they're doing it here and they're doing it there and they're doing it everywhere. And I find it a, it's more of an indictment on the failure of our leadership to provide uh, for a, a life that means something and people therefore needing to grasp onto meaning more than it is anything else. But it is not a good situation. And frankly, it is, it is like I said, more of an indictment of our times and of the failure of leadership everywhere. Than, than anything else. But what I would say simply is that this is not really religion. This, this thing that people have grabbed onto. It uses religious language. But using religious language doesn't make it religion. Otherwise, every time somebody well, you saw on the street saying, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, that's not religion. <laughs> that's anger, but using a very evocative word to sort of sprinkle holy water on your anger. It's like, I'm really angry this time, so I'm going to use that. That's not religion. So too when somebody blows themselves up in the name and uses the name of God, that's not religion. That's anger or frustration or alienation sprinkling holy water on it. Just a different religion's holy water. And so we've got people parading around saying that they're Jews and they're Christians and they're Muslims and they're Hindus and they're Buddhists doing atrocities with religious language. That's not religion. That's the abuse of religious language to justify behavior very different than religion. Long answer from a guy who taught religion for too many years. <laughs> I have, a, I have a simple two-part question. I can make it real complicated. Go on, try. <laughs> what should our timetable be on leaving Iraq, and what do you think the consequences will be? Well, look, I think that, the, uh, that Senator Obama's right. Uh, you, you have to talk to the military leadership first, uh, and you have to assess the situation uh, in the region first. But what you don't have to assess first is do we have to get out? You absolutely have to get out. The question of the timetable uh, is one that you have to think through. Now, I think that the Iraq study group gave us the way. And it gave us the way both in terms of getting out, setting a timetable to get out, but also investing the neighboring countries in a solution to do that. And I'm, you know, Lee Hamilton, who's working with Senator Obama, is having some influence there. I think, you know, it's not about sitting down with Iran at some meeting someplace. It's about saying to Iran and Turkey and Syria and Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, all of whom border Iraq, um, you need to sit around a table and develop a regional security arrangement to make this work. Why? Because none of you will benefit if it falls apart. All of you will pay the price. And all of you have a stake and all of you are involved. I remember when I suggested something like this three something years ago, somebody said to me, you mean you want Iran involved in Iraq? I said, they're already in Iraq. <laughs> and so is Turkey, and so is Saudi Arabia, and so is Syria, because they are logically in. I mean, we're seven, 8,000 miles away and we're in. Why wouldn't countries in the neighborhood be in? And of course they're in. The question is, will they be in under the table or will we bring them in around the table? And the point is, is that Iraq requires that all of its parties get together, but also all of its neighboring countries get together, because they're the ones fueling and in some ways supporting uh, some of the stuff that goes on there. So you have to do that. You have to create a regional security framework. Otherwise, it can be disrupted by any one of the parties that gets left out. And you have to talk to the military leadership in, in, in the United States who are there, but what you have to say to all of them is, we are getting out by a date certain. Now, Senator Obama says 16 months. I think that would be plenty of time. But it's not the time you said at the end. It's what you do between now and then that ultimately is the determinant as to whether it's a success or not. Is 16 months enough time to make it work? Sure it is. Is 16 months enough time to make it worse? Sure it is. And the question is, we have a choice. Will we spend the next 16 months either doing nothing or making it worse, or will we spend 16 months being creative and thoughtful to find a solution to help us get out and help the Iraqis survive and help the neighborhood be secure? That's the choice you get for the next 16 months. And we've had that choice now for years, 
but what our leadership has done is opted to either do nothing or continue doing what they're doing or do a little more of what they're doing, and the result has not worked because we're still where we are today. Okay, yeah. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, yes. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, <clears throat> if you could turn your attention for a moment to Iran. Yeah. There's a lot of attention and uh, on Iran these days. Uh, and there is a resolution in Congress now for more severe uh, yeah. sanctions, including what would amount to an embargo, with not so much discussion of consequences. And if you could give us your wisdom on that front, we'd appreciate it. I learned a long time ago in, a, um, uh, in an op-ed that David Broder wrote in the Washington Post that in an election year, Congress doesn't legislate at politics. And, and they're doing it again. Um, if I, I actually publish a, a piece that collects all of the bizarre pieces of legislation that Congress will come forward, at, you know, is coming forward with almost every week, um, and and it's uh, it's pathetic. I mean, APEC had their conference, the pro Israel lobby had their conference, and they issued their, you know, their talking points, um, and now Congress is putting every one of those talking points into some piece of legislation. And is it helpful? No. Is it going to get done? Of course it is, because you know they, you know they set the tone, and and folks just jump in line. Uh, I don't think the legislation that you're talking about is helpful. I don't think it's thoughtful. But I don't think members of Congress who are putting it forward and or voting on it are th caring whether it is helpful or thoughtful. What they're concerned about right now is checking a box so they can say uh, we did it. Um, and too much of our approach to the Middle East is based on that box checking uh, and, and without a attention paid to the consequences. And so when, you know, when, when Senator Obama said, we have to negotiate with them, um, and got denounced by everybody for doing it, including the other Democrats around the table, the fact is that's the one thing we haven't tried. Um, and, and, I, and I think that um, you, you We've, we've given enough time to try doing it wrong. We really ought to try a different direction to get it right. Because, you, you know, I mean, you can make that old story about the guy, you know, pounding his head against the wall and thinking, if I just do it one more time, it won't hurt. But it does every time. And so it, 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 it is time for us to begin thinking of a new direction of how we can move this region forward in a very different way. Yeah. Yes, you've spoken very eloquently about... But, but let me just say one thing. Iran is a threat. And Iran is a problem. Not to Israel and to us, but to the region that it is in immediately and to its own people. The question is, we have to find a way to deal with it. The point is, the way we've been dealing with it is not working. That's the, I, I just want to, I don't want to confuse the fact that I think that it's, it's just a, a, a wonderful little place that has all the best uh, goals in the world. It doesn't. Yeah. Okay. I commend you for talking about misunderstanding. There's yeah. an awful lot of that. But there's another side to it. Yeah. In the United States, as I understand it, there is an absolute condemnation of terrorism, the use of it. Sure. Yet I have yet to hear of any organization, Islamic, Middle Eastern Arab groups speaking out and strongly condemning terrorism and the people who help it and support it. Well, let me tell you something. I mean, just a little story before I answer your question. Um, uh, the year after 9-11, on the first anniversary, um, I was uh, invited by Tom Brokaw to come up to New York and be with him in the studio. 